Aloha and welcome to Autism, the Autism Motivations Workshop. Not all who wander are lost. My name is Victoria, and this is Maya, and we will be your wilderness explorer guides for this presentation. Next slide, please. Spin school and rule for a great Zoom. Workshop will be in webinar format. Your video and sound will be turned off to ask a question. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Be kind, be considerate, be respectful. All workshops will be recorded and posted to the Zoom, well, Spoon Conference website soon. Please help us by filling out workshop evaluation using the link provided in your workshop chat. Next slide, please. On the bottom of your screen, look for the CC Live Transcript button. Click on the up arrow to open a new window. Click on Show Subtitle, and the captions will be on the screen. You can turn off the subtitles by hiding them. Next slide. Please fill out a short evaluation for this workshop before you go. Next slide. Meet your expert guide, Anne Garfinkel, Associate Professor from the Department of Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Montana, and Michelle and Renee Manfredi, Parent and Self-Advocate. Um, please welcome our first presenter, Anne Garfinkel. Oh, um, Anne, can you please unmute yourself? Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. I missed the virtual spin last year, but uh, I was with you guys the year before that. So I'm happy to see you. And it's uh, afternoon here in Montana, but morning there. So I hope you had watched the beginning session. I'm going to talk about motiv motivating people with autism spectrum disorders. And the reason I got into that is um, I do a lot of work in classrooms. And, um, you know, people never call me to consult or look at uh, kids with autism. They would call me to consult for kids with disabilities, many of whom, almost all of whom, also have autism. And when I walk into the school, I see a motivation problem, not a challenging behavior problem. And so it pushed me to think about um, motivation in a slightly different way. So um, that's kind of the background of this. So I want to just give a general definition of, a, of motivation. It's from the Latin word meaning to energize, activate, or move. It's the insistence of motivating. It's a drive. It's an incentive or pro, our progress, something to get us to uh, do something. So it's different than an I can't, it's a I won't. So if, you're, if you can do something and you don't do it, that's a motivation problem. If you can't do it, that's a skill and instructional problem, right? So all the world, all the motivation in the world can't get me to do something I just don't know how to do but motivation can help me do things I already know how to do. So for the general population, um, common motivators would be to minimize physical pain and maximize pleasure, fulfill basic needs like eating and drinking and breathing, to get something um, or to get a goal state. Um, and there's some less apparent reasons like altruism or some issues around um, people's sense of morality. So motivation is a cause, a process, and an effect. Basically, it's the energy that you need to do the action for something you already can do. So the, some of the issues with motivation is when you have, 
have a lack of motivation, um, you can have challenging behavior. You can cry, you can be non-compliant, inattentive, you might get fidgety, you might engage in escape behaviors, you might be tired. And this one's particularly interesting to me, you might show decreased mastery over time. And we definitely see that pattern with a lot of our children and students with autism. They work and work and work, and then the longer they have to do the same task, it looks like they're losing that skill when really it might be that they're just not motivated anymore. So what's interesting to me is when you look at this list of um, what happens when you're not motivated, it's a lot of what we see as challenging behaviors, which kind of goes to talk about what I um, said was one of my leading interests in getting into this topic. So there's all kinds of motivational theories. Um, motivation's a bit well studied in, in business, not surprisingly, but almost every field has a theory of motivation. Um, and, and yet in special education or in disability studies, we tend to really focus on the reward system. And um, that might be in terms of reinforcement, but there's literally something in the brain called the reward system. It's a dopamine um, based system um, that really responds to ext extrinsic reinforcement. So we do know there's a biological factor there. So this is, uh, the, I call this the Snickers slide because I think everybody has seen that Snickers commercial where you have somebody that's angry or hangry as we say, and then eats the Snickers and then they're a new person. Well, this is the same idea. And this is one very general sense about how motivation happens. So at the bottom in the psycho physiologic level, if you don't have food, water, sleep, things like that, then you just can't perform at the next level. And then if you have those basic things in place, then we can talk about safety, like security, family, health and property. Then if you have those things, you can build on love and belonging, like family and friends. If you have all those things at the bottom, then you can start to work on self-esteem and confidence. And if you have um, those things, then we can self-actualize into being creative and spontaneous and problem solvers. And so this is just Maslow's take. This is his view. There's lots of others um, who have variations on this, but this is a good just general framework for us to think about. And when we think about that, I look at the bottom at the physiologic level and I see kids with autism suffering from a few of those. So quite a few have breathing issues. Um, many kids with autism have a restrictive um, interest in food and often many have um, challenges with sleep. So when I think about the population of people diagnosed with autism, I think sometimes we're in this bottom rung where the basic levels haven't been met. And I think, <clears throat> Um, one of the things we do with uh, school age kids with IEPs is we spend an awful lot of time on their deficit areas. That's what the IEP is about, is their deficit areas. And so getting up this pyramid <coughs> to build confidence and get to creativity is, is a challenge. And yet once kids um, get into the adult system, they're asked to do, uh, they're given an opportunity to do things they like. So there's a disjunction between those two systems. So um, there's some other issues that affect our ability to be motivated to do tasks. One is emotion, executive function, grit, which, which is just the staying with something over time, how impulsive somebody is, perhaps the time of day, um, or things that happen earlier in that day, which in the behavioral world we call setting events. And so what's interesting to me about that is um, often people with autism have a hard time um, understanding what they're feeling or at least communicating about it or understanding others people's feelings. Sometimes they have issues around executive function. And so it's possible that our current theories of motivation aren't good fits for people with autism. So the general behavioral thought about um, reinforcement is there's a stimulus or an antecedent or something that causes um, somebody to pay attention and then the response is what they do and then the outcome is what happens regard, with regard to that. And so in the motivation world, it would be you see something or a cue that would start you to, to move 
and then you would do something and then you feel again something good for that reward system so that you continue to do it. So um, I could when we talk about things like motivation, the traditional model, um, especially in applied behavior analysis, which is the primary treatment for people with autism, um, I think you got to talk about intrinsic and extrinsic. It's a it's a discussion that's hard to do online. <laughs> Um, just and it's a big discussion. So I just want to really say that acknowledge that this exists and that it's um, one of those it's like nature and nurture. People definitely have an idea about it. Um, so I just want to briefly talk on it. So intrinsic motivation is motivation that when you have you're driven by an interest or something inside you, extrinsic comes from outside of you, right? And some people say, that in, intrinsic is more important than e extrinsic. And um, I'm not sure the neurobiological science is gonna end up thinking that's true. And I'm not sure in the real world that that works. So for example, um, personally, I'm very uh, internally motivated for my work um, with people with autism um, and yet I get paid to do it. And so, the desire and interest is the intrinsic, but the paycheck is the extrinsic. And I'm not sure without both of those that that's not some, that that doesn't create um, the opportunity for me to do what I'm doing. So I think that the there is a dogmatic portion, but I think in the real world people are not as um, extreme. I think it's a um, a false dichotomy, or perhaps a false dichotomy. So just another view of that, there are some things that have intrinsic value, like belonging, mastery, power, autonomy, meaning, learning, self-knowledge, things like that. And then there's extrinsic rewards, like um, going up levels in a video game or badges or points or any of being on a leaderboard or getting a gold star, all those are extrinsic. So um, people like to divide things into that kind of world. Um, so, one of the things I hear a lot, um, especially from parents, but also teachers, is that they will use extrinsic reinforcement to help a child with autism learn something. So the child is asked to perform a task, they perform the task, they get something they like. Um, that's the model of extrinsic reinforcement. So, you know, you do your homework, you get computer time, something like that. You um, ask for m and you get the m and Those would be two examples of um, positive reinforcement. Uh, and I think what happens in the field is we're very much um, ingrained in that world. You do this, you get that. And if you don't, um, if, if it's not working, meaning the child or person isn't doing the task we want, it's because what they get isn't powerful enough, not a true reinforcer. So when professionals hear it doesn't work or it stopped working, um, I think people, and I definitely felt this for a long time, will go back to, well, then it's not a reinforcement reinforcer because if it was a reinforcer, it would by definition increase the behavior you're looking for. But as always in my experience in the field of special education, which um, I've been in for over 30 years, um, listening to parents can give us good insights. And so if we really take their feedback of it doesn't work or it stopped working and dive a little deeper, we can see there might be some limitations of reinforcement, especially for this autism population. So there were a couple studies done um, and Maya will appreciate the Sally Rogers uh, citation here, um, that reinforcement rewards only work for about half of the autism population. So that there's some data behind that. I would not say that's a well-held belief, but it's an interesting insight. And I also want to say there's a lot of known factors associated with effectiveness of reward or reinforcement. So IQ, lower IQ, the effectiveness of that reinforcement seems to go down. Age, the lower the age, the more likely those external reinforcements work. Um, just the reward processing itself. So we'll talk about how people with autism may have um, in some neurological differences that maybe make a difference. 
sleep um, deprivation, and we know many people with autism suffer from sleep issues. Um, and attentiveness, another core feature of um, autism. Decreased levels of physical activity, increase the effectiveness of rewards. We also know that pe many people with, uh, on the autism spectrum disorder do not get enough physical activity. Different kinds of medication, again, common in this population, not enough uh, can affect the working of that uh, reinforcement. Um, anxiety and depression, over 12% of the autism population has anxiety or depression. Um, which can decrease the effectiveness of the reinforcement boredom and um, that a sense of social relatedness or belonging, which are also issues for this population, may dampen the effectiveness. And so those are things I think we rarely think through when we think about reinforcement. Instead, we just think about finding other extrinsic things to add. So we're always on that force. And of course, you know, part of the definition is that restricted repertoire. And so that also plays in. Kids maybe just don't like enough. So I've been talking about the reward system for a minute. I'm not a, I'm not a neurobiologist. I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, but I think I can explain this a little bit. So the brain's reward system involves all of these different areas. And um, I don't think it's that important to know too much about it. Uh, it, it's driven by dopamine. So dopamine is a neurochemical. It makes, it's what makes you feel good. And so you eat something you like, you do something you like, you feel good. Um, and that's the system that drives all these different parts of the brain to act as the reward for doing something you, uh, you like. So it does make you feel good. Um, we like it all the time. There's what it looks like. Dopamine is called the happiness neuron. But this is an interesting finding to me. So remember I had that S and the R and the O, the signal response and outcome. That corresponds with these words at the bottom of the slide, the signal and then um, work would be the R here and reward would be the outcome here. And what's interesting about this is you get your dopamine hit or that feeling of happiness at the time you see the antecedent or the signal, not at the time you actually get the reward. So in the quote unquote normal brain, we've already experienced that happiness neuron or neurotransmitter, neurochemical, um, before we've even um, gotten the reward. So it's the anticipation of getting the reward that gets the dopamine to flow throughout your brain and to get you to feel good. So what's this matter? Well, for kids with, who are typically developing, whatever that means, they want something and they like something equally. So when you think about this system having to work, you have to want what you're gonna get at the end of doing the task, right? You have, you have to like the reward. And for um, the typical brain, they want to get it and they like getting it. They can also figure out the probability of receiving the reward. So when the probability is low, they work less hard. When the probability is high, they work harder. Um, they can um, move pretty effectively between stages of learning, moving from novice to master. And um, for them, concrete tasks are more usually associated with the reward system than abstract reasoning. But for children with autism, it might be different. And so, in fact, we do know that with kids with autism, they don't want uh, in, a nor in a normal way. Or in, I don't, I don't like to be so, um, to use such judgmental language, but their wanting part of the brain doesn't function the same way as their typically developing peers, even though the liking aspect is. So they, they might not have access to wanting something, but they'll like it once they get it. So how does that reward, how does that um, come out in this reward system? Well, if you don't know that you want something, then you don't ever get that bump of do dopamine, which dopamine is not only the happiness neurotransmitter, it's also the movement transmitter. So if you don't get that bump of dopamine, you don't start to move. And um, kids with autism also don't do well at figuring out the probability of the reinforcement. So they don't often know how hard they wanna work. And extensive use of 
Um, external reinforcement may lead to teaching habits instead of goal-directed behaviors. So just to make this idea of want and like more concrete, if you don't know you want the outcome, which is the reinforcer at the end, then you're not triggered to move into doing the action. But once they get the outcome, they want it. So one of the mistakes I see a lot of people, a lot of paraprofessionals, but a lot of people do, is they'll say, do you want, you know, the iPad? And they'll say yes. And then they'll say, yeah, but you have to do that. And then they don't want to. Right? They want the thing, but they don't know. They know they'll like the thing, but they don't know they want it enough to, um, to again, trigger this um, neurotransmitter. Okay, so that's all pretty technical, but let's see what happens in real life. So here are some interventions that may support the reward system in students diagnosed with autism. Uh, diet, choice making. Choice making is one of my favorite interventions. Recently, I've seen it used uh, way to the extreme. And so if you make people make too many choices, they will have decision fatigue. So choice making can be a, mo um, a helpful intervention, but it also can become a demotivator. Using things that we already know are effective, like schedules, making clues salient, um, increasing the number of reinforcers, thinking about uh, the time of the day, um, and avoiding those demotivators and avoiding habitual behavior. So in terms of diet, here's a quick overview of foods that generally are associated with increasing dopamine. I'm not that kind of doctor either. Um, so how do we usually man, uh, motivate kids to learn? Through praise or encouragement, social relationship, or contingent reinforcement. So here's my simple diagram of learning. Something happens in the, some cue happens. You do some kind of behavior, you get some kind of outcome, right? You can also, um, we could make that diagram much more complicated. So let's talk about what we can do at this cue time or the stimulus or the antecedent time. So of course we can use kind of some kind of structured learning, which as you see here, here's another version of structured learning, another um, version of structured learning. Here's a task that's been uh, structured, the learning outcome, a uh, learning uh, place, environment. Here's another structured task for teaching. And here's a different kind of structure. So all of these things um, is something we could do before we start asking kids to do something. So arrange the environment, make it structured, using kids' interest, varying the task, um, choice making, error-free learning, or the big one is non-contingent reinforcement. So we're all very, um, we're all very knowledgeable about contingent reinforcement, you do this, you get this. But the data actually shows that non-contingent reinforcement, meaning just fun things the kid like is free in the environment and they don't have to work for it, is as effective. I'm going to say that again. It's as effective. The data shows it's as effective as contingent reinforcement, and yet people are worried about using it. So um, paying attention can also help with motivation. So how do we make the task motivating? Using interest, using the medium they like to use, making sure you're only teaching one thing at a time, using mastery skills to reach new ones, using making things visual and balancing demands throughout the day. Now we all know we can also use the consequences of motivation, things like positive reinforcement we just talked about, schedules of reinforcement or what people call penny boards where kids um, get a reward, in one case an actual uh, penny, in another case something they like, and then after they earn in each of these cases five of those, then they get access to something else they like. Um, a lot of the kids I work with, if you actually pick those, what's represented by a token or, or the penny or the dinosaur here carefully, they're motivated just to get that. So little boy I work with likes um, I'm not gonna get this right, but like all of the masters of the universe or something. So he, every one of those superheroes he earns, he's very motivated to complete the whole group. And that alone is motivating for him. So we do know there's lots of ways to make this kind of motivation really um, effective, but 
keeping in mind how hard the task is with how much they're earning is really important, especially when you look over time. So remember the child needs to be able to access the reinforcement in order to be effective. That's one of the things I hear a lot in schools. Um, I'll, they'll set up a very fancy earning system, but the children never um, do a, have access to it. So they have no idea if it's effective intervention or not. There is pushback, concentrating on those consequences. So thinking about praise versus feedback. Feedback would be, hey, you did it. Praise is good job. And for using um, reinforcement properly, we wanna use feedback. So we wanna tell the kid what they did, not how great it was. We also want to make sure we're Im um, embedding in their learning these kinds of strategies so that they build the capacity to become more self-actualized. So having an emotional vocabulary that's bigger than mad, sad, glad, learning to motivate themselves and stay regulated, learning to self-monitor and self-regulate will result in determination and all that in will result in higher levels of self-motivation. So keep in mind that when is this a skill issue, meaning um, it's a motivation issue if the person has the skill but isn't doing it. It's an instructional issue if they have not, they just don't have the skill. So my final thoughts before I pass this on is to remember that there may be real challenges in the reward system of people with autism. They may just have a different, their neural pathways um, associated, associated with uh, dopamine may be different. Motivation is something not just at the end, like we traditionally think of in ABA, but it's throughout the whole uh, process. And think about some of those um, aspects that um, affect, uh, affect motivation. I think fatigue, boredom, and low levels of engagement for sure are think, something to think about. This is a super new area of research. I've just been working on it in the last couple of years, and I think um, maybe it holds some promise. So stay tuned. There's more to come. And thank you for um, my time today. Yep. Thank you, Anne, for a wonderful and eye-opening presentation. Um, oh, just a reminder for um, participants, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentations. Uh, and please welcome Michelle and Renee Manfredi. Aloha. Aloha. Next slide. So we wanna say good morning and good afternoon for us here in Texas. It's a little after two and we're very pleased to be here today. And um, I love the photos that were chosen by Amanda and Susan from the LASPEN conference that we could attend in person. And we're just very excited to join you today. Aloha everyone. It's so exciting to be here and we hope you enjoy our presentation. <clears throat> today I'm going to elaborate a little bit on something Anne mentioned in her presentation, the interest of your child and how this has become a pathway to a freeway for the Manfredi family. What is that thing, that thing that causes you to say, oh, let's talk about something else, the thing you wished would go away, the thing that kids at school might make fun of your loved one about? Is it Disney? Is it Star Wars or Minecraft, shining objects or singing? What I hope to share with you today is a way that I have learned that this is my best tool and maybe the very doorway you've been looking for, the tool that you wished you could find to broaden their scope. I wished I could tell you that every time I heard Renee write, recite some movie, my very first thought was, ooh, this is great, and I can use this to her advantage or to my advantage. But that's not my story. My story is of a frustrated mom with a list of goals and expectations before her and her child. Goals and timelines often set by doctors, evaluations, and IEPs. Through much failing and beating my head against what seemed to be an immovable wall to try to drag Renee into my world 
and all that my world was asking for her. I ended up leaving the most important tool and opportunity for us out of this picture, her world. Though I tried to respect Renee and all things Renee, shiny beads I crawled on floors to get and chains from the post office that they used to have with pens that I would steal so she could feel them, the numerous Disney movies we own, using these as tools was not something I could see how to do. I often think goals and can be barriers to success sometimes, and success seems to be measured by someone else's yardstick very often. I think I lost Renee in those goals, and I'm not sure I ever got to really appreciate Renee for being blinded by all the things she was told in school she couldn't do, but the things that she needed to do, such as counting money successfully or successfully navigating public transportation. How could I celebrate her disability when I could hardly see her? but I could always see Disney going full power all the time. Here she was incredibly successful, reciting her Disney movies or singing her Disney songs. And this world made sense to Renee. And I began to ask myself, what does success really look like? Is success not including the world she understands? Or is it building in the world she understands? And how could I bridge this gap? And I'll be the first to confess, this was a difficult way to think for me. I'm a little anal retentive. And how could I use this looming force before me to bring us together? I always felt like I was hacking my way through a jungle, but right over there was a really large freeway. I just didn't know how to get us there. But Renee was already there. I just needed to join her. When I left my road and joined her on what I saw as the road less traveled, we began to have different conversations, non-goal oriented conversations. For her, real conversations and the language she understood. I think for Renee and maybe for the first time, she was being heard. She had been communicating all the while in a different language that no one appreciated but one that made sense to her and I couldn't understand it. Just like she couldn't understand my language or her teachers or the instructions in school. Yes, these were all Disney conversations, but aspects of Disney mirror real life. And I began to pull from that. I would say, remember how Ariel was tricked by the sea witch? And we would be in a conversation with her thoughts on that. Isn't it great that Belle loves to read? And what do you think Belle is reading? Another non-goal oriented moment. And she would come to life animated, interested, because this is what she understands. And here is where I met Renee. And then came Star Wars. And the webbing for me really began. This is where Princess Leia and an entire galaxy met Renee's family. She liked a particular character best, Qui-Gon Jinn, played by Liam Neeson, and he would become a central figure or friend in my life. She wanted to see more of Liam Neeson in other movies, and so the next movie that was out was Schindler's List, and she wanted to watch it. And that led to another interesting conversation. Now we were talking about World War II and her thoughts on that not just Disney or Star Wars, but the real world. And now her world was growing. Here we were building bridges. Liam Neeson is in the A-team. What's the A-team, she asked one day. And for people my age, you know, the A-team was a super important time in life. So I went to Netflix and we watched all of the A-team. We learned about gangs and legal jargon, good decisions and bad decisions. And here she was learning about my world in a way that she could understand and she could connect and transfer ideas. She began telling me what she would have done differently or how she felt like that character. She was able to use those characters to identify her own emotions. And now we were having conversations about her, her feelings, things that mattered to her, how things in school had hurt her, conversations that doctors said would never happen. Quote, you will most likely be speaking for her her entire life. I suspect she will never be able to express her feelings. End quote. I think of that thing that I read, well, hold her beer. 
This became my bridge from her world to my world. And now we weren't on a road less traveled, we were on her freeway. People communicate in a variety of ways, but I'm not sure we're always hearing their language. How can we engage in a conversation in a language that they understand in the world where they are successful? And can we bridge that gap? Our journey still has barriers and struggles, but it is an honor to sojourn through Renee's wilderness. It is way more animated and full of life than I could have ever dreamed. And now I look at each facet as a resource, not as something I wished would go away. That looming interest has become my best ally. Where will Liam go next? What will we learn from his next adventure? And when she is struggling to understand something or struggling to share how she feels, or more importantly, maybe when I am struggling to convey an idea, this is the road I go to. What movie did we see that in? What character had that struggle? Because this is her language. And this is where she will find her words. This is now where I meet Renee. And on that note, let's meet Renee. Aloha e komamai, everyone. Thank you so much for hearing our story. We will now go a little further into our journey as to how we got from where we were 36 years ago to where we are now. And it starts where, when I began with Special Olympics. Now, I confess, I'm not really much of a sports person. And I was scared to go because when I was in school, I would always mess up in a sports activity because I don't always understand instructions very well. So I wasn't very keen on going. But my mom said, what have we got to lose? If we don't like it, we don't have to go again. And I have to tell you, when I stepped through those doors, it was like, as Aladdin sings, entering a whole new world into a, wo a world full of possibility and opportunity. And I developed skills I never knew I had, such as self-confidence, and I was even able to convey my thoughts, which is where my journey led me to the Athlete Leadership Program, where I learned about public speaking. Here, I was scared to go because I question was, would anybody care? When I was in school, no one seemed to care about what I had to say. And then someone did care. And this was so new to me because when I was in school, the focus was always on what I couldn't do, not what I could do. I could sing, but it was as if I was invisible. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Here I found my voice. And next slide. It seems that, now I'd like to tell you about a time in school that still sticks with me. I was in chorus class in 10th grade. I was always in chorus class because I love to sing. And I kept asking my teacher for a chance to do a solo in one of our many assemblies. But each time he put me off, like he never really answered me. It seems to me that when you have a disability, that's all anybody really sees. They don't really see you. And for me, that means that all most people saw was some girl talking to herself or reciting movies or being lost in a class. But singing was something I did understand. I've been singing my whole life, Disney movies mostly, and musicals. With singing, I didn't need any help, and I didn't get lost. Finally, he gave me a very small line to sing. I was so excited. I admit I was scared to be on that stage, but I was so thrilled to be given a chance to be there. Afterward, so many people from the audience came up to tell me what a great job I did. Or they'd say, I didn't know you could sing. And while I am so proud of that moment, it is also a sad memory. My teacher never said a word, like it never happened. Maybe to him, I was still that weird girl. Now, I know no one determines who I am, but I always just hope people give other people a chance. You never know where that chance may lead, 
or how impactful that one moment may be for someone. When Susan and Amanda asked me to sing Over the Rainbow, well, I cried my way through it, but I was beyond grateful to be given the chance. I cannot thank them enough for giving me that chance again today. Thank you, Susan, Amanda, thank you, Spin Advisors, and thank you all for being with me today. Now at this time, I'm gonna sing a song that I hope many of you are familiar with. This is me from The Greatest Showman. Uh, I don't think they can see it. Can you take it off background? Fine. I am not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say, no one will love you as you are, but I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for we are glorious. When the sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send a blood, going to drown them out. I am brave. I am bruised. I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, because here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. Whoa, oh, whoa, oh. Whoa, oh, 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 this is me. Mahalo, Louis, Aloha, every, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for singing with us. <laughs> that was great. Okay, now we'll do a Q&A session with our speakers. Uh, Victoria, would you like to lead us in that, please? Hi, Maya. Um, Victoria is experiencing some technical difficulties with Zoom right now. She's able to hear, but she can't see us. Oh, no. Okay. I will be happy to lead the Q&A then. Let me start my video. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya. Uh, thank you so much, Renee and Michelle, for that wonderful presentation and that wonderful performance. Renee, that was truly beautiful and very moving uh, and thank really you. just so special. Thank you for sharing your family story with us. Um, and again, thank you to Anne for a really wonderful and super informative presentation. And I thought that was a really nice overview of some pretty complex material um, and you just sold it down really well. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in through our Q&A. Um, Anne has already typed some answers in, but we'll read them out for people who may not have gotten a chance to see. If you do have questions either for Anne or for Renee and Michelle, please type them into the Q&A right now and we will have a chance for them to answer those questions live. Um, I can see there have been a bunch of comments coming through, Renee, about your singing. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the chat. Um, I see things like, good job, look out because you come, so beautiful, awesome. The tears are running down my face. So I think a lot of people were very moved by that. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a couple questions that I would like to start with. 
Um, so one question that I hear a lot from parents is, how do you share um, about your child's motivating likes and dislikes with teachers or other people working with them? And this is a question both for Anne as well as Renee and Michelle, um, whoever would like to answer. Anne, I think you're muted still. I, I would like to hear what Renee and Michelle say because uh, the way you phrase the question, it's definitely how do you share that? I can talk about um, add on afterwards, but I think sharing with the professionals, I would love to hear Renee and Michelle's strategy. Thank you, Anne. And I would love to be giving a really good answer for that. I don't think that when Renee was in school, sharing what her motivator was. Like I knew it was movies, but movies weren't where they are today. And so people weren't very, being very creative with using movies or maybe comic book uh, novels. And in 10th grade, Renee did Macbeth. Macbeth with a graphic novel, which really was such a, a brand new creative out of the box way. Um, today, if we had to go back, we would create the, uh, a thing, um, an all about me book. This is what my motivator is. There's many different uh, styles and samples. You can kind of Google them. Um, the star, you know, this is what upsets me. This is what I like. And I think that's a really good because it's, it's short, simple sentences with a picture of who, you know, who I am and what, what helps me in my day. Yeah, when I think about um, really helping professionals understand kids' motivators, definitely helping the professional understand, you know, it's part of their job to continue to expose the child to more things, to see if there's more things they like. I also think that everybody, parents and professionals, need to keep in mind that motivators change over time. That might be over the course of one's life or it might be in a matter of a few seconds. And so really, um, I try to build um, a connection to the professionals saying, you know, you might like pizza for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two days, but the third day you get pizza, it's not gonna be the same. Um, so uh, drawing some attention to that, I think is important is just how does motivation work in the professional's life so that they can sort of have that perspective. And then I think, um, you know, if you are really successful at capturing motivation at home, sharing how that happens, you know, whether that would have been for Renee, access to movie clips as well as some more singing, um, I think, the All About Me book is great. I think even videos can be helpful so people see what it really looks like. Um, and I do think it's part of our job is to keep um, uh, making sure, despite that restricted rep uh, repertoire of interest, bringing new things into that those people's lives until they can find that. And then figuring out where the community has value for that, right? So. Um, if I had to work with a kiddo who loves 3D puzzles, well, where's the community for that? Well, it turns out every one of the residents in his group home wanted a 3D puzzle build of their favorite movie characters. It turned out that was really easy to parlay into making things like um, bird feeders and other um, things that would have a bigger audience. So. I think um, thinking broadly, thinking of this as a consistent lifelong thing we want to talk about, and then um, drawing it back to the professionals and their own experience with motivation um, is key. And I really, one of the chats I answered, I do think about, we don't think about demotivators enough. I think we spend a lot of time thinking what a child might quote unquote work for. Um, and not what kind of barriers we might be putting in place that um, are taking away the motivation quality. So I hope that was a broad answer, but I hope it was helpful. And I, I'd like to join in what Ann said about, you know, continually exposing. So 
what I learned to do through the movies that Renee liked was to web from that. This is an interest and we can web to another interest and to another interest and to another interest and bring them all. So if you have people on your team that you know, will take just a little bit of time to listen to what your child is talking about and where else can that, you know, where's the connection with that, right? This character is also in this movie. Can that, can we move to there yet? I think is, you know, building bridges all the time. Thank you so much for those wonderful and thoughtful answers. Uh, we had a couple more questions come in through the Q&A. Um, I believe this one is for Anne. Um, you briefly talked about non-contingent reinforcement. Can you give examples of this in the classroom and home setting? Uh, I feel like this is what motivates my child during his OT sessions, and I'm glad I now have a term for it. Contingent reinforcement doesn't seem to work as well for him. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is another, well, I kind of put into practice what I just talked about. So if you think about yourself, if you had to work for everything that you liked, that would be tiring. Whereas if you get access to what you like, just in your environment, I mean, that's how we set up our homes as adults. You can see why that would have um, a just a feel good, but also a motivating, um, be, it could be motivating. So here's a couple examples of non-contingent reinforcement. Um, I work with a kid who um, could read, a, he was a kindergartner, he had autism, he could read actually above grade level, but to get him to participate in a reading group um, was really challenging for him because of all the social aspects and things like waiting, his turn, and you can imagine, I'm sure. Um, so we found if he, he liked those kind of veggie chips, um, if he could get his veggie chips out of his snack and eat his snack as he was participating in reading, he was 100% there. But the idea of having to do the hard behavior before he got the chips was just about a non-starter. So that's a good example. I work with another kiddo who he likes stickers. I understand a lot of people do. My husband loves stickers. Um, and he likes them. Um, he doesn't have to work for them. So it's just like, oh, we changed. Uh, hi, how are you? Look at these stickers I have. He gets so excited. He puts two or three on a piece of paper. He'll do some work. Um, and as he's doing it, the work, if he starts to stall, we'll just offer a sticker. Hey, do you want this sticker? He gets refocused. He likes the sticker. He feels good and he keeps going. So it's not that he has to do a certain amount of work. It's just in his environment. It's, uh, there's a symbol for it and is by a seat. He can request it anytime he wants. Um, at, in terms of home, you know, the same thing. Like um, I, I hesitate to talk about electronics, but um, because those have a downside, but um, it's, the, it's the difference between saying having um, the bowl of fruit that the kid likes on the table versus them having to request it. So if it's something they like or the music they like playing in the background instead of them having to communicate for it. So certainly we do want to add extrinsic motivation or reinforcement to elicit some specific behaviors, but other times we just want that to be in the environment so that the child's happy and more willing to, to do what we ask because they're basically in a good mood. So I hope that that makes sense um, to everybody and, they, and that people can see how that's powerful. It's almost like Renee and Michelle's story about once they started to look at those areas of interest, then the motivation took care of itself because they were in the, those areas of interest. I see them both nodding. I don't know if you guys can see them. So maybe you guys want to talk about that a little bit more. I know you mentioned it in your presentation. Well, I'm thinking about what you're saying. And I just remember back when Renee was in school, like we never had the star chart or anything because the whole day was challenging for Renee. And I, I don't always know that, you know, the goals can become so they can control everything that you kind of forget. It's been a big day for your person. The whole day was tiring. And so just making it through the day maybe and not crying was a huge goal for Renee, maybe. It wasn't a goal, but I mean, if she could do it, that was kind of a, a big deal. And then to make anything else a goal was just daunting. 
So there were some things like Anne is saying that they just were, you know, you, you got dessert because it was part of dinner. That's, you know, that it's just part of our life. You, you get your, we're doing this because we're a family and that's the way we're gonna do things. It's not a reward. Renee's whole life could have been a reward system and it, it the whole thing kind of tired her out actually. Yeah, so I actually wanna uh, piggyback on that. I think sometimes when schools try to have parents or parents try to um, do a homeschool um, intervention where the kid's behavior at school is then has uh, implications for home life, we might be setting everybody up for disaster. So if the if the system is the child earns access access to Xbox by you know being good at school, and they don't get that, then we put the parents in a bad place, right? Because to make the intervention theoretically effective, the Xbox shouldn't happen at home. Well, if that's the only thing that soothes that child after a hard day, or that's the only thing the child can do independently, and mom or dad has to make dinner and take a shower and do their own work and take care of their dog, then we've just created a, a inadvertently, I hope, a really big challenge for the whole family system. Whereas I love what you're saying. You're just part of the family, so you get this. You're just in the classroom. You got to hear, you got to listen to music you like while you work, if that's what everybody gets. I have seen a couple of kids who, um, by taking away everything that they show an interest in and making it something they have to work for, they inadvertently learn not to be interested in the world. Thank you both it's for those really, really insightful comments. Um, we had another question come into the chat and we only have a few minutes left in our session. So I'm going to read it out, but maybe we can keep our answers to this question fairly brief. Um, and I do want to um, let everyone know that there is an evaluation. I'm going to find the correct link. I realize I put the one in there is for the conference in general. I'm going to find the one for this session. Um, and I will post that in the chat. So if everyone could please do that before leaving, that would be great. So the final question is, uh, is there a way to adjust the IEP goals to reflect a child's interests and motivations? Um, this came from a teacher and she agrees with you that it's deficit focused instead of interest focused. I think there's a, quite a few ways to use the IEP document. Um, to reflect that. So in the child strengths and interest, both from the family and the educators, they could be stated there. But I think we underuse the supplemental aids and services aspect of the IEP, where we can really say what time, where, and under what conditions does the child get that. Um, I worked with a kid who always had a video playing. And it was just like his white noise. And that was specified in the um, supplemental aids and services. Um, and I also think you can think about positive skills. So you can only teach one thing at a time. So if a child really likes so doing something, then can the goal be to do that with um, typically developing peers or do it in multiple environments or something like that so that we um, use the IEP to teach those um, skills, um, even though they're not, maybe it's something that child already can do, but teach them in new environments that might be hard. So those two things come to the top of my mind. I don't know if you had any success about doing that in the IEP. It sounds like after you got away from school it was easier for you guys, but. Um, yeah, it was a little bit easier after. We appreciated the teachers, like I said, the one that you know used the comic book. So she recognized uh, Renee's interest in cartoons and Disney and this was her approach. So we still did Macbeth. We still followed the curriculum. It was just done it like in a different way. Um, that's something I think that maybe a lot of people struggle with is how to be focused more on the positive and the cans than, than the can'ts, but still have, you know, realistic and achievable goals there. Um, I, I, that's something I think could be a long conversation. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much. Just a thought. No, that that's a great answer. Sometimes it's just something we need to think about and talk about more with people. Um, so once again, thank you so much to Anne and thank you so much to Renee and Michelle. This was such a great session. Um, there is one question still in the Q&A for you, Anne, if you want to answer that via chat and the person who did that can stick around just for a minute. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. All right, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, everybody. Great presentation. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Good job, guys. Thank you.